Well, the Gospel of Luke. That's where we are in our uh, afternoon series where we're going through the different books of the Bible. Luke is the third of the four Gospels. Each of them tell us about the ministry of Jesus, in particular, especially about his death on the cross. All of them have a large proportion of uh, the book is devoted to that. But each one of them, as we have been seeing, makes a unique contribution to help us know our Savior better. We're enriched. We're the richer, maybe I should say, for having um, four Gospels instead of just one. Matthew, for example, presents Jesus to the established church of his day. Saw that. The Jewish church. He shows how Christ fulfilled the prophecies that were given to his people in the Old Testament proving that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. He showed, Matthew shows us how the established church responded to him the same as they had done to the prophets before. That wasn't good. <laughs> they, uh, they persecuted them, and they uh, stood against them. And, uh, so they rejected their own Messiah as their Savior. And uh, Matthew also shows how outsiders were often much more ready to receive the Lord Jesus than the covenant people themselves to whom he came. So writing to the covenant people, he humbles them in that way. Then with Mark, we saw how Jesus was presented to the Roman people. Okay, so Matthew is to the Jewish people and Mark particularly to the Romans. Mark gets straight to the point in his gospel, declaring that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God in verse 1 and uh, then showing his authority through his actions. And things that Rome was very interested in were, were actions. If you've, if you've got it, do it kind of thing. They were the ones that were always going out, conquering and achieving and setting up governments. Authority was a big thing to them. He shows that uh, he has all authority, that Jesus has all authority, much more than any Roman emperor has ever dreamed of having. But he shows that he uses his authority Remember, not to be served, but to serve. That was a powerful thing we saw in Mark that's emphasized. He shows how Christ deliberately sets out to give his life a ransom for many. That's what he does with his authority. He gives his life. And today, with Luke, Luke is writing not to Romans, but to the Greeks, who, though conquered by the Romans, still had their philosophy and their culture. The Romans weren't uh, all that great in that area. And, uh, and, and the Greeks had uh, still had a lot of that that was prevalent in their communities. They were different than the Romans in that they were more speculative, even to the point where ideas could be embraced without corresponding actions. In other words, if I think in the right way, then all is well even if I'm not doing uh, very much, <laughs> regardless of how they were living. For example, maybe how they were treating their neighbor or something like that, but I have these, these rich thoughts, and things that are the right thoughts. Uh, they, they had their histories, but in their religion, they also had their faith stories about gods. And Luke wants to make it clear that he's not just speaking of a story, but he's speaking of one who came in history from heaven to be with us. God who came in real history. He's telling a real history. Jesus is a real man who is also truly the Son of God. And he had a real birth. He did real miracles. And that he demands a real commitment of our lives to him. Not just faith, right ideas, without commitment, but the kind of faith that repents of sin and follows Christ. They also, the Greeks also placed a lot of emphasis on rank and status. They're very concerned about that. But Luke emphasizes that Christ has a special regard for the lowly marginalized. Remember how we saw in Thessalonians with the, the great people there that they would, uh, the, the wealthy people would get a bunch of, uh, of people around them as clients so that they could have more clout in the community. They could look important as they went around with these Client, they just they supported people and paid them just to come and, and hang out with them, so that they would look uh, important and go to meetings and things like that. 
These are all things that we're going to look at today related to the Gospel of Luke. These, these truths that ro roll out of that. So there's three things there that I mentioned to, to break them down. A real history of a real Savior that brings real joy and hope to the lowly and that calls for real commitment. Not just ideas. So let's proceed with the first point. Luke gives us a real history of a real Savior. Let's look at the introduction, okay, the very first four verses to Luke. Luke 1, 1 through 4, it says, Luke says, Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Notice that Luke refers to the events in Christ's life as those things that have been fulfilled among us. That indicates that Luke, or, or that Christ and his work are things that were foretold by the prophets of the Lord and that have now been accomplished. Luke says that many people have been talking about them, many of them who are eyewitnesses and ministers of the word appointed by the Lord have been doing so. There's been a lot of information about this from reliable first-hand sources. Luke says the information is there from reliable people. In verse three, he shows that it is his purpose to collect these various accounts and put them into an orderly account. Okay, he wants to compile the different things that were being said about Christ and what he had done. He wants to compile them and arrange them. And he says that he does so as one who has perfect understanding. Now, that would indicate that he knows that he has the Spirit of God enabling him to bring forth the very Word of God. This sense of speaking by the Holy Spirit becomes all the more evident when he speaks of the outcome of reading his book. Luke has great confidence in what he's writing that it is something that is of the Spirit of God. So he writes in verse 4 that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. The certainty. That's the goal for this man, Theophilus a ruler among the Greeks, whose name actually means God-lover. He is a man who had received instruction about the gospel already, heard it from all different places. People were talking about it. There was a lot of discussion about it. But apparently from different sources and some that were good and some that were not. Luke is going to compile the material that uh, is from credible sources. And he's going to put the material from credible sources together in an orderly fashion, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that Theophilus can have a certainty about what to believe. This is what really happened. What a tremendous treasure this book of Luke is for a man who wants to know the truth. As Luke makes clear, the things that he is writing about have to do with our eternal standing with God as either blessed or cursed. It calls for a radical commitment of your life, one's whole life, there is no place for uncertainty for something that you need to know is true. You don't want fragments about Christ. Some true and some false fragments that you don't know which is which. But you want an orderly account of things that are certain and that you can believe. And obviously, if Luke's account is able to provide certainty for Theophilus, Theophilus is also able to provide certainty to you who read this book today. God in His providence has seen fit to incorporate this in the sacred writings, this book of Luke, of the Holy Scripture, for the blessing and benefit of His people. This book is designed to give us certainty about Christ, that we might, each one of us, have hope, and that we might wholeheartedly follow Christ as our Lord and Savior. Now, what is contained in the historical account that Luke gives us? Let's just look at that in, a, in an overview, quick overview fashion. 
what does he have in this book? Well, he begins with a full account of Christ's birth. That's in contrast with Mark. Where did Mark begin? This is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he went right in through his baptism, his public ministry. You'll remember that's how, how he began. Mark simply asserted that he was the Christ, the Son of God, and then he showed us proof by the actions of Christ. Luke, on the other hand, spends two chapters. And chapters that are long enough to make up five or six chapters. It's a, it's a lot of content uh, telling us of the birth of Christ. Notice how he writes as one who is giving real historical facts. He has already said that there were many eyewitnesses. You, see, you can see a typical example in verse 5 of how he speaks about real people of history. He says, there was in the days of Herod, so he's given a historical time frame, the king of Judah, okay, here's an individual, he was the king, a certain priest, there was a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was... So he has, it, this is historical people. This is people that, that could have been looked up. Some of them were still alive or, or would be known. There were people that were uh, in a history. This corrects the false teaching that can be found in some branches of the church today that what we have in the Bible are myths with meaning. Myths with meaning. Things that faith communities developed over the years to give them inspiration for life, but did not necessarily really happen. So those people would say, oh, well, the Bible is very helpful, it's very important. It's even the, they might say it's God's Word and because you got all these inspirational stories, whether they're true or not, doesn't matter. It's what they do to you that matters. See, that's the view of the ministers in the church that I grew up in. That was, that was the view that they held. What, what matters is not that it happened. It's just, uh, what does it mean? That's what matters. New Testament takes a very different perspective. It says that they didn't happen. For example, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, we're still in our sins. If he didn't really come and die on the cross, there's nothing for us. There's no hope here. It's not just a story. It's something that actually happened. So Luke lays out the unfolding of the history of Christ's birth. He gives an account of the prophecies that were given of his birth. Just before he was born, like at the time of his birth. Uh, the visitation of an angel to Zacharias. You know, the birth of his barren, of a birth to his barren wife of uh, his son John, Christ's herald. That's in chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. And then of another visitation to Mary, telling her that she, a virgin, is to bring forth the Messiah by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that the child will be called the Son of the Highest and will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Messianic, right? It's prophecy, a messianic prophecy. Uh, Luke 1, 26-38. Then Luke gives us the beautiful, joyful, prophetic responses of Mary, Elizabeth, and Zacharias. You know, there's uh, all, all that in Luke 1. Telling of Christ and how God by Him visited His people to bring us salvation, to fulfill the mercy that He promised to His holy, co to, to his holy covenant in the fathers, and to the fathers. Uh, already in these prophecies, there's an emphasis on Christ not only blessing the important people of the world, but the lowly people who look to him for salvation. So there's that the prophecy and then the responses of those when, when uh, there was pregnancies and births and things. In chapter 2, Luke lays out the actual event of Christ's birth, specifying that it came about when a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, there is the historian again, that all the world should be taxed, uh, taking Joseph with Mary, his wife, to Bethlehem, that decree took them to Bethlehem. It's real time, real history. Joseph's wife, the still virgin Mary, who is with the child by the Holy Spirit, brings forth her firstborn son, wraps him in swaddling clothes, lays him in the manger. Luke tells of the witness of the shepherds who were also visited by the angels and told of the birth and who went to see for themselves and then broadly reported it all around the area. People remember that. People knew that. He tells of Jesus' presentation at the temple when the offering of purification was made 40 days later and how the prophet Simeon and the prophetess Anna separately approach and prophesy that this child is the Christ and make this known to many people. 
Then there's the note of joy that's found continually through this account. Joy in the Holy Spirit because of who Jesus is. Next, Luke gives us the testimony of John the baptizer and of Jesus' baptism along with his genealogy. Not like Matthew, who goes back to Abraham, Luke goes all the way back to Adam. He's writing to the Greeks, not just to the Jews. He shows that he is not only the hope of Israel this way, but also the hope of the whole world. Following this, Luke gives us account after account of Jesus' word and works. He includes many of the miracles that are found in Matthew and Luke, I mean Matthew and Mark, and he includes a few others that are in neither of them. There is the casting out of the demon at the synagogue of Capernaum, followed by the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, and then uh, many other people that were healed in the region we, that we just saw in Mark recently. There's the cleansing of the leper and the healing and forgiveness of the paralytic that was let down through the roof. There's the calming of the wind and wave and the raising of the dead and the feeding of the 5,000. There's the restoring of sight to blind Bartimaeus at Jericho. There's the raising of the widow's son that is not found in the other Gospels. We'll mention that later. All laid out, real histories, real names, real places. Unlike Mark, who focused on Jesus' work, so Luke also includes an account of his sayings, his words, including many discourses of Jesus that are not found in Mark. He included some of his sermons, like Sermon on the Plain, many parables, and much teaching about discipleship. Now, Mark has a bit of that, but he doesn't have nearly as much. Uh, and Luke includes some of his discourses against the scribes and the Pharisees that uh, we, we saw, for example, in Matthew. And like the other Gospels, Luke gives us a full account of Jesus' trial, sufferings, crucifixion, death, resurrection, and unlike the others, he gives us a relatively full, or, or at least a, a, a fairly substantial account of the ascension. But all of this is presented as real and certain history that we ought to believe. Now, of course, the other Gospels also present it as real history that is to be believed. But you see, with Luke, this is the focus from the start. I'm telling you what happened. I'm compiling it so you can know the certainty of those things. And this is brought out more in Luke to give us hope in that way of the, that, that these are historical things that have occurred. And that brings me really to the next distinctive of Luke. Luke emphasizes that Jesus brings real hope. And in particular, he brings it to the lowly and the marginalized of society. This is certainly not absent from the other Gospels. I mean, just last week in Mark 2, we were looking at the calling of Levi, the the tax collector, one that was a reject in society, and uh, who, who was called to be one of the 12 disciples. And when we studied Matthew a couple of weeks ago, we saw how he and his gospel emphasizes Gentiles. He particularly focused on Gentiles. But Luke goes out of his way. He includes lots and lots of accounts about every kind of person on the fringes being welcomed by Jesus. It's a distinctive thing. Tax collectors, prostitutes, widows, women in general, Gentiles, the poor, and just ordinary people. That's Luke's focus. This all starts with the prophecies about Jesus at his birth. Mary, a woman betrothed to a carpenter from Nazareth, says of herself that the Lord has, Luke 148, regarded the lowly state of his maidservant so that henceforth all nations will call me blessed. And in 152-53 she says, He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. And then you have the shepherds in their fields who are considered untrustworthy because they were lowly shepherds. They smell bad. Um, They were the first to receive the tidings of Jesus. We see them filled with the joy of the Lord. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. And then you have Simon at the temple, or Simeon, sorry, this, this elderly prophet who speaks of Christ as a blessing to the Gentiles in 2, 30 through 32. 
He says, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles in the glory of your people Israel. So Luke is saying, this is for those outsiders. And then you have Anna, an elderly widow who is a prophetess, who sees him and tells all who are looking for redemption of him. Who's seeing these things? Shepherds, widows, an old man. There is throughout Luke an emphasis on the importance of the lowly to Jesus. Our Lord does not share our distorted notion that women ought to have equal authority with men in the church and the home, but neither does he at all share the perverse idea that because they are not called to positions of authority, they are not important to him. Luke indicates that both women and children are even more important to Jesus than those in leadership, and that it is the duty of those in leadership who share his authority to put women and children first. You almost get the impression is given that if Jesus learned of a, a sick king and a sick and impoverished widow, and they were in opposite directions and he was going to heal them, that he'd go to the widow instead of the king. That's what you see here with our Lord Jesus Christ. He would go to heal the widow first. That's the impression that, that Luke gives us. Here are some ways that Jesus shows us how important the lowly are to him. Luke tells us of his compassion on many women, of the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, 438, of the rising of the dead, of the son of a widow of Nain, uh, Luke 7, 11 through 17, of the daughter of Jer Jairus, whom Jesus raises from the dead, 8, 40 through 56, and while en route to her, the woman with the flow of blood, been afflicted and ostracized all these years, Jesus heals her. Of the healing of a woman who is bent over and couldn't raise herself up for 18 years. Luke 13, 10 through 17. See, Luke highlights these. He has accounts of some of these, like the widow of Nain, that the others don't have. Women and children receive much praise from him. He points to the superior love of the disreputable women, of the disreputable woman who washes feet with her hair, to the love of Simon the Pharisee, who criticized her but didn't even give Jesus a proper greeting. Seven thirty-six through fifty, she loved much because she was forgiven much. It is women who are commended as those who provided for him out of their substance. Luke eight one through three, as he went from place to place. When his disciples disputed about who is the greatest, Jesus took a little child. Now the other Gospels have that too, but uh, Luke has it, it, emphasizes it. Luke 9.48, he said to them, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all will be great. Martha complains of her sister Mary who is sitting at the feet of Jesus, but Jesus commends her for her devotion. Luke 10, 42. One thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Women and children, men are called to lead in prayer and preaching, but that doesn't mean that Jesus does not delight in your worship. Women are not called to get up here and preach in the pulpit, to lead in prayer in the, in the pulpit, but you, your worship here with God's people is just as important if not more important, as you gather with God's people. That's the kind of thing that we see. In Luke 18, 15 through 17, Jesus blesses infants who are brought to him and commends them as examples. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Jesus tells us which offering he regards the most out of all the offerings as he watched people bringing offerings. Which one was it? Luke 21, 1 through 4. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. I remember one time when I was in, in uh, campus ministry and I had given a, 
uh, uh, a testimony of my conversion and something along those lines. And I, I was really, really poor for various reasons. I didn't have enough money to get where I needed to go in my gas tank and I hadn't told anybody about that. And this, I saw this little lady that came, she came walking up. It took her a long time. She walked up. She came around and, and she reached out her hand like this and she gave me something. And, I, it, and it was a crumpled up $1 bill. And I was able to put enough gas in my car. This is back in the old days. <laughs> enough gas in my car to go where I needed to go. <laughs> so um, it, it always reminds me of, uh, of the widow, the widow's might. And uh, women are also prominent on the way to the cross where Jesus speaks to them. Luke 23, 27 through 28. And at the cross where they stood by him, or actually at some distance, it says Luke 23, 49. At his burial, Luke 23, 55 through 56, it was the women who came with him from, the, from Galilee and, and, and followed after him. They observed the tomb and how, his, and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. And at his resurrection, Luke 24, 10, where it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. So Luke emphasizes, he names all these women that knew about the resurrection before the apostles did and went to tell them so. Besides women and children, Luke highlights Jesus' regard for other lowly persons and for marginalized people. In Luke 10, Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know that Samaritans were not at all regarded by the Jews. And so Jesus chooses him to be the one who showed care to the man that was injured alongside the road rather than the priest and the Levite. It is Luke that we have, in Luke that we have the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son that are uh, each found and that bring rejoicing, showing that those who had gone astray, those tax collectors and sinners that were despised, when they are restored, that there is great rejoicing. Jesus showing how he welcomes sinners who repent and how we ought to do the same, welcome sinners who, who repent, no matter what they may have done. In Luke, there, he has the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Only in Luke. See, it's a, a poor man. Lazarus is a poor man who ends up in paradise instead of the rich man. Luke 16, 19 through 31. It may be that nobody regards you on earth, but if you follow Christ, you will be regarded in glory. And the rich, as Mary said, will be brought down. There is the account of Zacharias, the tax I mean Zacchaeus, the tax collector who marvelously repents when Jesus comes to Jericho. Luke 19, 1 through 10. He's only in Luke. And he's filled with joy, prompting Jesus to say in Luke 19, 9 through 10, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It's Luke who tells us. Not only that Jesus was crucified with two thieves, but also of the one thief that repented and was received into paradise that very day. Luke 23, 43. And Luke concludes with the other Gospels, the confession of faith by the Roman centurion at the cross. Luke 23, 47. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Jesus' attitude toward the lowly is summed up for us in Luke as well. In Luke 10, 21 through 24. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son and the one to whom the Son reveal, wills to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear and have not heard it. What hope there is for all of us in these things. You don't have to be important to gain the attention of Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a big shot to be important to Christ. All you have to do is come to Him and He will welcome you and He will exalt you 
over those who are exalted in this earth. Jesus takes delight in calling not the mighty, but the lowly. He shows that the power is not in us, but in God. Blessing comes from Him to those who realize that they are unable to bless themselves. Salvation is of the Lord, and He is glorified not by people who think they have saved themselves and the Lord does the other half, but by people who know that only in the Lord is their salvation. What encouragement this is for us. What joy, what hope, what assurance. If you're lost and you know it, there is a Savior for you. Repent, come to Him. And that brings us to the third thing that Luke emphasizes in his gospel. Something that Greeks need to hear and something that we need to hear. That Christ, the real Savior, who came in real history, calls for a real commitment from those who come. A change of life kind of a commitment. As I mentioned, the Greeks to whom Luke writes tended to think that if they knew the truth, and if they assented to the truth, they had done all. We've inherited a lot of that from, from the, the Greeks, I think. Luke shines the spotlight on Jesus' teaching that those who come to Christ must repent of their sins. We also need this teaching today. On the one hand, there are those liberal Christians who don't believe that the Gospels give us true history. Just stories from the community. I mentioned that before. Stories of faith to inspire us. Well, these folks don't repent toward God. They do not come back to Him as their God and turn to His commandments. They get inspired by these faith stories that are in the Bible, inspired by these faith stories for whatever cause they want to be inspired for. They can be inspired for the cause of transgenderism or a woman's right to an abortion or the inclusion of all faiths at the same table. They come to these same scriptures with their myth accounts and then they get inspired for whatever they want. They don't repent toward God. They go out to do what they call good in the community, but it's not really what God has called for. On the other hand, you have those conservative evangelicals who believe the Bible in a way and talk about grace and acceptance through Jesus, but at the same time teach that you're more a victim that needs acceptance than a sinner who needs to repent and be forgiven. They talk about accepting Jesus and being healed, but they do not talk about laying down your life for Him and keeping His commandments. In their minds, grace does not lead to commandment keeping, but instead it says that commandment keeping is not important. Okay? If you have grace, then commandments aren't important. That's what, that's what it's taught. Grace is what leads us into obedience. It's true that we're not saved by keeping commandments, but we're all sinners and we must have Christ's righteousness, but it is also true that we are saved so that we can walk with God as our God. That's our problem, that we don't walk with God as our God, and salvation is to restore us to walk with Him and to keep His commandments, to love Him and keep His commandments. This is a whole man. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is what Jesus said in the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And Luke, the Gospel of Luke, is a wonderful antidote to these false teachings that deny repentance. The book of Luke has a strong emphasis on radical discipleship. From the earliest prophecies of Jesus' birth, Zacharias is recorded as saying that God visited us to fulfill His promise to Abraham. Listen to what he says, Luke 1, 74, 75 to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might do whatever we want. No, that we might serve Him without fear in holiness and righteousness before Him all the days of our lives. The goal, as always, of deliverance is that God delivers us so that we can serve Him, so that we can walk with Him, so that we, not so we can keep on sinning without any punishment, but so we can serve the Lord. And then John the Baptist comes. What's his message? A message of the baptism of repentance. That we need God to wash us from our sins so that we can be forgiven and live for Him. So that we can repent. That's why we need to be washed. Yeah, forgiveness is part of the washing. But so is repentance. A change of heart that brings a change of conduct. John the baptizer spells out what repentance should look like. 
that the person, this is only in Luke where he spells this out. The person who has two coats needs to give one away. The tax collectors need to be honest about what they connect, collect. The soldiers need to be content with their wages. Very practical stuff. Everyday stuff. Change of life. <clears throat> when we get to Luke 9, Jesus begins to press the importance of true discipleship. You look at Luke 9, 23 through 26. After telling his disciples that as their Messiah, he is going to die on the cross, what does he say then to them? He says, Luke 9, 23, if anyone desires to come after me, if you want to be with me, you want to be my disciple, he says, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. It's super clear. If you have, you have not really come to Jesus Christ until you put aside your own agenda and give your life to live for him. He does not want you to talk about it. He wants you to do it, to live for Him. In chapter 12, Luke talks about fearing God and about being sure that you're busy serving Him when He returns. Or Jesus talks about that. It's recorded by Luke. He speaks of the division that comes in your own family when you follow Him, between those who follow and those that don't. In Luke 12, 49 through 53, quoting the prophets about how man's enemies will be those of his own household. And in chapter 14, he really brings radical commitment to a head when he says, 1425, now great multitudes went with him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And in other words, nothing comes before him. I remember as a new Christian when I was reading the Bible, you know, as a Christian for the first time, and I got into to Luke and I thought, this is a book that calls me to discipleship. And, you know, I remember Luke 14 particularly, that it stuck in my mind that, you know, this is a, a radical call here. And, and then you have that wonderful example of Zacchaeus, the tax collector, and of his repentance in Luke 19. Some have said that with this account, you have the whole of Luke's gospel summarized. Because what do you have here? You have a, a marginalized person. You have someone who believes in the historical reality of Jesus Christ and his uh, mission, who, who, and who repents, whose, whose whole life has changed. Uh, Zacchaeus sees Jesus coming and he is desperate to see him. He climbs a sycamore tree to get a view of him. This was not a man that would climb trees. <laughs> this, was, this was a rich guy that, uh, that was very, very honorable type citizen around town. He, he, here's this little man climbing up in a tree. And an extremely wealthy tax collector with all his fine clothes on, I'm sure. And, uh, and then in verse 5 it says, And when Jesus came to the place... He looked up and saw him and he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today I must stay at your house. And then we see how Zacchaeus repents. Verses 6 through 8. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. There's the joy part. As I say, Luke emphasizes that too. But when they saw it, they all complained saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Okay, so that note comes out. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, so, okay, here he is. He's got the Lord over at his house. There's a feast going on. Coming to eat with him this day. And here he is. He's, he stands up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. That's repentance. And then we see how Jesus responds that this is an evidence of this man's salvation. It's had a change of heart. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. He's a son of the promises of the gospel of Abraham 
but by repenting now, even though he's a son of Abraham before, now he's repented and come into faith. So now he has salvation. He says, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So he was lost, even though he's a son of Abraham. Now he's found. Here's a man moved on the margins of society who forsakes all to follow Christ. And of course, it would not do to fail to mention that at the end of Luke, Luke tells us what Christ said to his disciples about repentance after his resurrection. What does he want them to do? Luke 26, 46 through 47. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it is necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. It's a message for all people, repentance and remission, following Christ and forgiveness. They go together. This is not something to stay in your head. Okay? It's not just a head thing that you, you know and you think, but it's a life that is lived, a whole life. It permeates the whole life. And to help us with repentance and radical discipleship, there are four things that Luke emphasizes that are part of following Christ. There's an emphasis all through Luke on preaching. We just saw that, didn't we, in Luke 24, 46 through 47, that repentance and remission of sin are to be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Earlier in the gospel, we have John preaching. We have Jesus preaching. We have him sending out the 12 to preach. We have him sending out the 70 to preach. Preaching, preaching, preaching. You think about that. Jesus multiplied himself 70 times with people going out to preach in all the different villages as he was going around with these disciples. And there is the parable of the sower that speaks of receiving the word that is preached. Luke also has special emphasis on prayer. Okay, so preaching is, is one of the things that of our discipleship that helps us in our discipleship. Prayer is another. Luke mentions prayer more than any of the other gospels. And he includes a lot of teaching about prayer that are not in the other Gospels. When the angel comes to Zacharias in 113, it is to tell him what? Your prayers have been heard. Isn't that an interesting way to, to, to greet the guy? Hi, Zacharias, your prayers have been heard. What would happen if the angel said that to you? What would that mean? Would that be a good thing? Or would there not be much there? When Jesus is baptized... Luke alone mentions how he was praying when the Spirit came down upon him. Luke 3, 21. It's interesting, that little note is added in. He was praying, the Holy Spirit descended. The other Gospels don't have that. Uh, Luke 5, 17 says, So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. And 6, 12 speaks of how he continued all night in prayer before he uh, appointed his disciples. And in Luke 18, 1 through 8, he urges that men ought always to pray and not to lose heart with the parable of the widow with the unjust judge. She's heard because of her persistence. That parable is especially in Luke. Here you have a widow and a persistent widow who's heard. This is discipleship. And then at Gethsemane, he said to his disciples, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And then he prayed earnestly while they slept. Okay, we have that in the other Gospels too, of course, that one. But prayer is essential to true discipleship. There's no real following of Christ without prayer. And then the Holy Spirit is also mentioned in Luke. Not as much as in John. Okay, John mentions the Holy Spirit a lot. But in the begin more than in the other synoptic Gospels, in the beginning of Luke, those who prophesy are all said to do so by the Holy Spirit. And in Luke 11, 13, there's a special emphasis on the Spirit as the gift that the Father gives when we pray. Jesus says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? What does Matthew say there? How much will he give, more will he give good gifts to them that ask him? What is the good gift that he gives? Luke says, it's the Holy Spirit. That's what he gives. That's what we need. We need the Holy Spirit for true discipleship. Uh, true discipleship goes forward in the power of the Holy Spirit because we ask the Father for the Holy Spirit and he gives the Spirit to help us. 
Okay, and then a fourth thing that's mentioned in Luke, central to discipleship, is joy. Joy is emphasized in Luke. If you don't have joy in the things of the Lord, in serving the Lord, you're going to be crippled in your discipleship. You're not going to be very committed because you're always grasping for things that you can get here. And you don't have this, you don't have that. And, oh, we should that. And, what a bummer. Joy is essential to true discipleship because it shows sort of what we talked about this morning, that you're truly in touch. You're mindful of what God has done and how great it is. You're mindful of His grace and how wonderful and powerful that is. In the first part of Luke, Zacharias, Mary, Elizabeth, and her friends, the shepherds, Anna, Simeon, and all the angels are said to be rejoicing. Okay, there's joy, joy, joy all the way through. Jesus tells his followers to rejoice and leap for joy when you're persecuted because your reward will be great in heaven in Luke 6.23. And he says to rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Not that the demons are subject to you. It's a good thing. But much more that your names written in heaven. Luke 10 verse 20. And then in Luke 10, 21, the next verse, Jesus rejoices that God has called the lowly to him. That verse that we read earlier. And then in Luke 15, it's a great joy. Why? The lost sheep was found. The lost coin was found. The lost son was found and came home and was received by his father. Joy, joy, joy. Though it does not say so expressly, the joy of Zacchaeus is obvious, isn't it? I mean, that, man, that was a happy man. He was climbing trees. He was uh, standing up and giving half his stuff to the poor. That, that, that man was filled with joy. And Luke ends, very end of the gospel, with the disciples returning to Jerusalem after Jesus ascends into heaven. With what? What did they take with them when they returned to Jerusalem? With great joy. They went with great joy. Luke 24, 52. And, and here we must end too. But if we really understand the gospel, we will be filled with joy, full of joy and full of praise to God. So you see that the book of Luke is a very helpful gospel for us to read when we have grown sluggish in our walk with God. If you're sluggish, come to Luke. Great book. It gets us back in touch with what is real and true. We were back on the theme of what we were looking at this morning. That Jesus, the Son of God, truly did walk in the world. That He truly went about doing good. That He died on the cross for us. That He was raised, ascended into heaven. That His mercy and saving work is very real, very personal. That He brings it not just to the mighty, but to those who are weak and needy especially. And that such a Savior calls for our all. No half measures will do. We lay down our lives and follow Him, hearing His Word, calling on His name in prayer, walking in the Spirit, and filled with the joy of His and praise of Him and His salvation. Luke, or rather the Holy Spirit through Luke, knows how to get us back in touch with the reality of Christ and His salvation. Please stand and let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the Gospels that you have given us in our, in our Bibles. We thank you that they're so very helpful to us. We need them. Father, even the distinctives that are different from one Gospel to another, and yet they all tell the same story. We thank you, Lord, for how we have a real history that we can count on, a reliable history, real facts, real things that happen, the Son of God who came, the Son of God who did miracles, the Son of God who was raised, who was crucified and then raised from the dead and ascended to your right hand. Father, we pray that we would receive all of these things with joy in the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that we would turn to Christ and that we would radically commit our lives to Him. No half measures. Father, by your grace that you would help us. We thank you that we can carry this gospel to all peoples, no matter what they may have done, no matter what their rank or station may be, the gospel is for all. It is especially for the lowly. And we pray, Lord, that your word would go forth with power and that we would see it accomplishing the purposes for which you have sent it.
We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.